There we go, well, Paul. How are you doing, sir? Good. I hear it's all camp. over. Let me let me encourage everyone to be on Mega Camp because I saw Gary uh, do a presentation to uh, to his regional leaders, and he said, you know, Jay and I discovered something. We started to interview people for Mega Camp, and then we realized, I, I forget what there, there were, but two of their first interviews came up with these ahas that they had just never even heard about. So the theme that Gary developed for this is what are the 25 things that you need to know that you don't, right? And that's going to be the highlight. And then, of course, if you want to go in and see all the other in-depth interviews, you know, there'll be the chance to link to that. But what he's really trying to do is highlight from, from the best players, things we don't know that we need to know. Yeah, like for example, one agent said that, and I'm not familiar how this works, but that Zillow will provide you a list of for sale by owners in your area. Oh yeah. Yeah, well, that's something that, you know, when Gary heard that from somebody, he went, I didn't know that. I didn't know you could get a list of for sale by owners from Zillow. Whoa. Yeah, in fact, Cal, speaking of that Zillow idea, um, Ashley Bruner just got a $600,000 listing this week on Creek Hill Road through that Zillow for sale by owner. For sale by <laughs> owner. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, so that, she took it as a lead or that was just, that became a, um, that she saw that it was listed and then that became a, a way for her to prospect to them. Correct. Yeah, okay. yeah, and Ashley, oh, good Ashley, for her. Good for her. For Ashley, yeah. Ashley is a dude, so he just went and stopped out and said, "Hey, let's talk," and uh, yeah. he helped. And he just okay. kept talking, 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 and they he wouldn't give up. And they said, "You know what? <laughs> come list it." <laughs> yeah, come talk to us. Yeah. So, Dave, it's eight o'clock on the dot. So yep. I usually hop on here and get things going. I am super excited to hear from you today and to Thank kind you. of get the juices running. Um, you've done so much research. I have to tell you, it, the trilogy. There it I is. I know you've the written more than trilogy. that, but this is my. I have this behind my shelf all the time, and this is yeah. really my reference. No, um, as we say, when I uh, I do a, a, a Zoominar called the you know magic comes in threes, right? And yeah, and okay. in it, I what I say is that that ought to be your dashboard. That the that shift and MREA ought to be on your desk right in front of you you know, up at the top of the desk, coil bound, so it lays flat, and then the MREI uh, over, at the, over at the side. That's the guidance system, absolutely. So those three books, would you recommend any other books kind of as, as having all the time? You know, we have the one thing, that's kind of another one. Well, I mean, our... I think that's fundamental. I mean, those are the fundamentals. The one thing is really Gary's sense of focus, right? And, and I think that one of the things that's easy in this business, particularly as we start to add people to our team is it gets complicated right it gets it gets a little chaotic and i think the hard thing is to remind ourselves the one thing right i one of the things i do in my mrea seminar uh, that that i do is to is to focus people on the seven uh you know dollar productive activities because i think anytime we start to stray from those seven dollar productive activities then we 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 don't get productive we don't make money in the time we have so yeah, I think, I think that's a good book. And then I think there's, there's some classic ones, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. I think Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. It's 80, the book's 80 years old, but it, the timeless truth, it's, you know, it's every year it's in the top 200 of Amazon books because it's that timeless truth. And then I think if anyone around you or on your team is, um, uh, is struggling with their attitude, then I think the then I think Learned Optimism uh, by Dr. Martin Seligman, who's the founder of Positive Psychology, is, is a, just a very powerful, realistic book. I tend to, I tend to sway toward more scientific, you know, uh, analytic books than I do the hype. The hype books don't, don't interest me anymore because I don't think they give you the way to do things. You know, most of us oh, right. are implementers. We need to know the way. We get the ideas. We need to know how, <laughs> you know, how is the thing that unlocks it for us. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And you said something that really caught my attention. We tend to overcomplicate things, right? And so our topic this morning is, you know, building teams, maybe how we've done it incorrectly, and then how, we, how do we bring it back to, 
you know, the fundamental basics. Yeah, right. But one of, one of the things I, t I struggle with or kind of ask myself is, is that for sure the best model? Like, should I be trying to explore a new model? And so what I would like to hear from you is how did you come up to this model? Well, we did it. We, well, we did it with thousands of hours of work with top agents. Gary and I did it separately. I was with Century Twenty One. He he was founding his own company. That in '96 we came together, started to build Keller Williams University, and then we started to work with mastermind groups. And then we really were both businessmen, so we understood that the big challenge for real estate people is to shift from being salespeople with a sales job into being business people with a business asset that they're building. They're really building a business, right? And, and so, uh, and then that, then there's a lot of disciplines that are about building a business. Anyway, we did that and then we started doing our mastermind groups and we started looking and getting best of practice. We worked very up close and personal with people like Linda McKissick, right? Who went from in 1991 from failing out of real estate in 99, she's got a seventh level team, right? Four, four, uh, uh, four administrative people, five uh, um, buyer's agents, two listing specialists, and a manager. And she's, she's not even in it anymore. After eight years, she's managing it. It's doing 350 transactions a year, um, you know, netting her four or $500,000 a year uh, in a very low-priced market at the time, Denton, Texas. And um, all, we, so we started working with, a, with those kind of people. Right. And then and then that's we gathered them in our masterminds and we just took the best of practice. And then we took what we thought were the best of practice in all different areas and kind of combined them, you know, into a uh, uh, kind of a, a mix of the best of practice. And that's what that's really what that book is. And then we also try to give it a path. Right. What's the path? That's why that leverage path is a big deal. It, you know, page. 196 to 203. Uh, to me, if there were seven pages to just review and review and review and review in my mind, it would be those seven pages, 196 to 203, because that's where you get to understand not just the hiring path, but the divvying up of the work path, right? So one of the things we did, it's very interesting, uh, but, but this, is the, this is kind of that analytic. We talk about um, trying to keep it simple, but truthfully, real things are complex, right? Real things are complex. So what Gary and I tried to do was go through the complexity and crystallize it into simplicity that made sense, right? That you could implement. So for example, we did, you may have seen, and maybe you guys have it in your, your market center, the, the path to the seventh level wall chart. Have you ever seen that, Paul? No, I have. I mean, I've seen the, the path this, to the seventh it, level in, the, in, the, in the, another book. No, I know, but no, no, well, this, no, this is much more... Um, uh, uh, analytic than that. Um, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's the 172 tasks of a real estate agent down the left-hand side of it. It's a spreadsheet. And then it goes across as you go from yourself and then an admin and then two admins and you go across this, this sheet, you see how those 172 tasks divvy up. Who does, who does what? of those 172 tasks. At the beginning, you're doing them all, but you can't, you know, you can, it's, it's overwhelming. Right. And so we did that. I mean, I, I laugh at myself because uh, we, we're just, you know, Gary and I are analytic freaks. So we just, we do dove in and we really analyzed the business to that level. But what came out of it was the job descriptions that you get in the leverage courses uh, of KW, uh, Keller Williams University, you know, all the leverage courses really have oh, wow. those detailed job descriptions that come out of that. And so now as an, as a, as an agent, as a mega agent wanting to really build that, now you have the sense of who does what on the team, who's responsible for what, uh, and you can see how that divvies up. Okay. So I love that we have the path. Now one kind of a, a beginning question is, so I understand these books were written by kind of getting a collective consciousness. Then having that's a good way to do it. I think that that's what actually we honor Napoleon Hill in, in the book, The um, Familiar Real Estate Investor, by saying he said that a mastermind is a gathering of people with common interests and, a, and an attitude of cooperation. And out of the, that, they create a third mind, a bigger mind, bigger than any of right. them called a mastermind. Right. And we believe that's what we do. And actually, I think we believe that's what Keller Williams is. I mean, Keller Williams as a company is a mega mastermind. We have all of this intelligence 
all of these players that share openly with each other. That's what mega camp will be. Right. And we all learn from each other in the sense that that mastermind is big. And that's what you're doing right now in this gathering here in your office, right? You're creating a mastermind of your best. Yeah, I mean, people. We, we did that a couple of weeks ago when we said, Hey, how are listings being accepted or, or offers being accepted? What are the practices that are getting offers accepted? And quickly by looking at a couple of examples, we saw what doesn't work and Beautiful. what does work. And yes. it was just a, and then it shifted two weeks later, all of a sudden the city properties weren't selling yes. as quickly, but we have to keep doing that in time, like just in yeah, time. Yeah, we have to, as Russell Shaw said, he said, you know, markets go neighborhood by neighborhood. The yep. ebb and flow of, of markets go neighborhood by neighborhood. So if you are a master market analyst, then you know what's happening in each neighborhood. And the neat thing you have in your office is you gather people together to say what's going on right now. See, that's so much power. I mean, that's one of the things that Keller Williams believes in, in synergy. You know, together everyone achieves more. And that idea of pulling your best players together to share that wisdom gives everybody more muscle in the marketplace and more wisdom. Yeah. Okay, so now going back to the MREA, not so much yep. local, but collective across the country. Sure. Building teams, we see a lot of teams that are built in a kind of hobnob and kind of a, a blob, as Gary Keller calls they're a them. blob, yeah, they're a blob. Yeah, now I'm curious, I'm super curious, if following this kind of basic model is yes. the strongest model, why yep. do so many of us not follow it or become creative and try something else? Well, What's because we, we warn about that in the book. We have the nature of entrepreneurs is to want to be creative and to want to engineer it themselves. Right. My ideas will be better than anything Gary Keller ever invented. Right. <laughs> so I like my own initiative. I like to do it my way. I have my own intuition about it. And so they don't go back and, and study the fundamentals. And I said earlier, uh, just be, before you hopped on, they asked me the question, what one thing would I say to start the morning? And I said, is go read the book. And a lot of people, <laughs> a lot of people leave the book. I mean, that's the we say in there, Warren Buffett read the book by Benjamin Graham on investing. He read it 12 times before any made any investments. And we kind of kid about you ought to read the book 12 times, but I certainly would go back to page 196 to 203 and I'd read that section multiple times because what it, what it, what it reminds you is that you are building a productivity specific team. You're building a business that's high performance. You're building a business that where people get a lot done in a short period of time and they, and they, and they, um, they work, uh, with, with, a, with an attitude of service and standards and systems, right? So there's, there's, there's kind of three steps, you know, in the evolution uh, of, the, uh, of, of, a, of a millionaire real estate agent business. There's the I do it, we do it, they do it. And I, I think that we, we kind of skip the I do it. In other words, we sort of wing it. We do good because we're good salespeople. We can make things happen. We do initiative and we do whatever we do. 50 transactions in a year and we think, okay, time to build a team, right? Well, we haven't mastered lead generation, not in any systematic way. We haven't mastered lead conversion. We haven't mastered productivity. I have a, I have a, a, a two page handout I do called high, high performance buyer specialists. See, because I think we under underestimate what buyer specialists are supposed to do. They should be doing one a week. Just that, that ought to be the standard 50 a year, 48, 50, 50 closed units a year per buyer agent. That's a piece of cake. I mean, when I interviewed Mike Mendoza uh, and we were writing the book and he's a mega agent in Arizona who really, who really didn't embrace our vision of building a team. He, his view was he'll have some affiliate agents. They can do whatever they want, buy, you know, buy, sell, whatever. They'll share some of their commission with him. He's got the administrative team. That's his key. And the share of their commissions they share with him will fund his administrative team. So he, in a sense, he's got a free administrative team, right? I mean, that's kind of the way he looks at it. Yep. Now he's not interested in supervising their activity, meaning the activities of those other affiliate agents. And they come and go, there's no, there's no sense of unity in it. And they really aren't operating under his name. They're, they're operating under their own name, right? Okay, but here's the key. What does Mike do? 170 listings a year and 50 buyers himself just by himself oh. not but with well not by himself 
with his administrative team. So if one, the one big mistake I would say agents make, if I, I highlight the five big mistakes they make, one is they underestimate the importance of their administrative team. That's why in the path to the seventh level, your first two hires are admins. Why? Because they're making you more productive. Like take the Russell Shaw team. He, they were a great role model for us. This is where they really made the light bulbs come off. Because here's Russell Shaw. He's got eight admins. He's got one and a half listing specialists and two buyer's agents. And they're doing 350 transactions a year. And here's the thing, how can, a, and he, his listing specialist, his number one listing specialist in the year we interviewed him, took 400 listings. How does one person take 400 listings? Well, the admin's doing all the CMAs. The admin's doing all the packets. The admin's doing all the follow-up calls to set up the appointment. All the listing specialist is doing is getting his assignments, coming in, doing his three appointments that day, all the packages already done. He gets the listing agreement signed, it comes back, does a little bit of, of entry work in their system, and then the admins take it from there to closing. So the, the thing, the biggest thing for me to agents to understand is the power of your team is you, your vision, you, and your skill, and number two, your administrative team. That ought to get you right there, ought to get you to 120, 150 transactions a year. You so the, and them. So, so the model is really almost like a, um, a surgeon in, a, in, a, in an emergency room Perfect. where he's going from room Perfect. to room, the staff Perfect. is circling the patient. Perfect. See, I think about, I went in uh, two, 20 years ago and had lensectomies, eye surgery, right? They replaced my lenses in my eyes, which got rid of cataracts and also gave me 20-20 vision. <laughs> it was kind of neat. And I'd worn glasses all my life. And so I remember going in and, and I was there my first appointment for an hour and a half and I only spent 10 hours with the surgeon, right? Oh, yeah. In the final 10 minutes after he his staff had done all the analysis and gotten all the reports and put it all together. And then he advised me about what he could do and, and, uh, and kind of what it would cost. Um, and then when I went in for surgery, I mean, I never saw him, <laughs> right? Because by the time he shows up, yeah. I'm out, right? But right. you think about all the other people, and I think that's a great way for a, for, a, for a real estate agent to think about it. They are the surgeon. They show up at the moments of truth. They show up at the listing appointment. They show up. By the way, I think here's one of the things that, that agents give up too, uh, too quickly, the identity of their team, that they mm. are the identity of their team. Mm. So when, what we say in there is you really the first thing you should do is bring on a showing agent. And what that means is you're meeting with this, the buyers, all the buyers, you meet with them, they get to meet with you. Then the, the time consuming part of it, the showing agent does, but then when it's time to put in the offer, you do it, you negotiate it, you hand it to your admins. The admins are always doing their work in your name. Hi, this is Dave Jenks, I'm, you know, I'm calling for Paul. Paul asked me to call you this morning. I want to update you on what's happening with your listing. I want to update you on what's happening with your, you know, the, the closing. And, and so everything is done in the name of the mega agent. And because one of the things that people struggle with is the fact that they have this kind of the buyer's agents are in and out, in and out. They come in and they don't last long and they leave, right? And, and, and often they'll take with them their clients, quote, their clients. Well, the one is right. the problem is their identity is that that's their client. There should be no question it's the team's client. It's the business's client. Now, it, it's not kind of a them and you, know, you. You're not trying to make this an ego thing like that's my client. You go, no, that's the team's client. Our business is a team. The business has a reality above me. I happen to be the founder of it. I happen to be the leader of it but the business has its own needs and its own standards and its own priorities. And we all live by them. Okay. So we all agree that, you know, with the millionaire realtor book and all the research you've done is collective consciousness, best practices brought together. And this is a great model. Is any one team the book? I would say the closest one that I've ever known uh, is, was probably Linda McKissick. Now she's out of production now and she's, doing training and, you know, she's a leader and has multiple streams of passive income, including over a million dollars a year in profit share. So she's, you know, she's in a different stage in her career, but she absolutely followed the book and worked with, closely with Gary and I as she was implementing her team 
And I would say, yeah, that was, that was very close to it. That was very close to kind of that, that model that we've put out there. Now, I don't, you know, here's the one thing I want to say to everybody. So <clears throat> I worked with, you know, I was in, I've been in real estate over 30 years. I worked with Gary Keller for 12 years. And then I took 10 years away and did a bunch of other things that were fun. You know, I did, I, I, I worked, built an, another national organization called Master Networks, business to business uh, referral a network with local chapters and help them found their company and build their master networks university. And I helped the founder of that write his key book called five plus one. And then I went and did a three year uh, uh, homeless journey around the United States with my Jeep <laughs> and, and my, uh, and my two mountain bikes and my golf clubs and just, just toured the country for three years. That was wonderful. So it was only a year and a half ago that I reconnected with Gary and said, Hey, you know, Welcome. You, you said we had to be involved in reinvention. Welcome to the club, <laughs> you know, now that you're back in as CEO. And he laughed about that. And so I've been re now reconnected and I'm doing, I mean, this probably when I do your afternoon seminar this afternoon, that'll be my 90, I think my 95th Zoominar in the last five months. So isn't that crazy? The, the way wild. you just shifted. Yeah. Well, it's funny. So, no, I, think, I think what happens is, and this is what we talk about funding your mission in life. See, once, when, when you're building your MREA team, you are locked in on it. That's your, that is your one thing. You are yep. building it. It's got you totally consumed. You're working it. But when you get to that seventh level and you've stepped out of it and you've now got talented players in every part of it, now you get to go do the other stuff you want to do in your life. That's a neat thing. And it's well-funded. Right. So I noticed something in industries, even in other industries, um, it seems success leaves clues and the higher level you get, the more the same things become. There you go. That's, so, that is so well said. We said that in the book. We said there's, you, there's, a, there's, a, there's a thousand different ways you can get to $20 million in production. Sure. You know, you can, and, and people will say, oh, here's the way to do it because this is what they did, you know, and there's different ways. But when you want to get to a hundred million or you want to get... To seventh level, see, because I think more than the money, there's something different from the money. And a lot of Asians get production oriented. By the way, that's one of the problems. If I would highlight one of the five problems is they're production oriented, not profit oriented. So they've taken what we recommend as a 40% bottom line and they've dropped it down to a 10 or 15. Now wow. they're still making a lot of money, so they're happy. And, and, and this, is a free, you know, this is a free enterprise system, so you're welcome to do that. But the point is that really disciplined businesses really, really focus on the bottom line because that's what gives you the leverage to be able to step out of it. So to, speaking of reinvention and, you know, every generation thinks that we're going to slightly reinvent. I did notice something when I read books, early 1900s, business was built on muscle. Then mid-century, it was more computers, automation, you know, the, that, more brain, right? Yeah. And now there's this evolution. It feels like there's, we at least talk more about the heart. Like Brene Brown talks about vulnerability, creativity, and all that. Do you see that heart stuff impacting real estate business or how you may rewrite real estate books in the future? I think we wrote heart into it. And particularly if you, if you also read shift, because shift is really the counterpart to MREA. Sure. So shift really shouldn't have been named shift. It should have been the fundamental tactics of top producers. That's what it should have been. We happened to write it at the time the market was shifting. So we gave it the shift flavor, but I would take yep. that book. I'd remove the first three chapters, wouldn't read it. I'd read chapter four through nine. That's the heart of the real estate business and chapter 12. And so what, what that book is about are the tactics of effective selling the scripts, the dialogues, how to get people to price it right, how to, you know, all that stuff. Lead generation, that whole chapter on lead generation in shift is, is super. It's, 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 it's wonderful. So I, I think those two things go together. But what you say is, see, we've always believed the heart was underneath this. We believe right. that's what a fiduciary agent is. They bring heart. And it's a relationship-based. We, we believe that your database is an RDS, a relationship development system right? It's really a relationship development system. And what you do, we call it in, in MREA, bringing people to your inner circles, right? From the haven't met yep. to the net, to the targeted, to the you know, clients, to advocates. And, and I think that is, that, is the, that is the key of it. Yes. And 
when we list on page 71 the, 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 um, the nine ways a millionaire real estate agent thinks, at the bottom of it, meaning the foundation of it, is service. And then above that is standards, meaning that you, you, have, a, you have a standard way you do it, right? It's the McDonald's thing. This is the way you do free French fries. This is the way you do hamburgers. But it's, but it's systematized. And then it's competitive, meaning, meaning that you know how to beat others in the marketplace and get your greater share of the business. And then it works its way up to big systems and big goals. And we say big why, but meaning that you know why you're doing this. You know why you're doing this work. So yeah, I think that's a very good insight. I don't know if general business, but I know we, when businesses get overly technical, they slide back to, to relational because this is a human enterprise. Right. And I would say that your, your marketing material ought to have heart. See, I think uh -huh. where your heart comes through is the way you communicate about yourself. The thing we're going to do with you, this, with your team this afternoon on um, why list with me is all about, all about heart, all about the wisdom of how you articulate your value proposition. That's at the heart of every business, by the way, how you articulate and speak to your value proposition. It shows up in your listing presentation. It shows up in your, in your, uh, in your lead generation and it shows up uh, in your marketing and, and being able to articulate your value proposition and for sure, uh, heart and service is at the core of that. You know, I'm glad you, you put that so well because I read these books and I kind of said, okay, this is the machine. And I didn't really, I, I kind of lost the heart, I think sometimes. And so this really helped me hear you say it that way. I think so, the fun thing is to read, the fun thing is to read the front and back. Because what we did whenever we wrote the books, the front end was how you think, right? Or the myth right. understandings, how you don't think, the, the thinking that gets in your way, the, 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 you know, that, that talks you out of, that we call it your, your limiting beliefs. That's yeah. the front end. And then we talk about your strategic beliefs, what you're trying to achieve and how that happens. Then we go technical, right? Then we go, okay, here's how you do it. Here's the job descriptions. Here's the, here's the lead generation piece. Here's how your database, the met and haven't met. All that works. Here's the path of hiring to the seventh level. So it all gets kind of technical. And then at the back end, there's always a close that's about, that's inspirational about uh, why this is important and why this is important to you. That's interesting. Mega camping follows that with the last day Mo Anderson has her, her heart. This is why we do this. Yeah, the inspiration, the same, yeah, family reunion, inspirational breakfast, you know, underneath. Yeah, I'm sorry. Under, yeah. Well, that's okay, but underneath it all is this idea that we care, right? That we, what we do, what we do with care. There, it's an interesting thing because uh, uh, Mo was running uh, one of the, um, the uh, culture summits, you know, and, and bringing the, the culture icons in. And I, said, right. after, and I said to her, I said, Mo, can I speak? May I, may, I, may, I, may I give a little 20 minute talk? And she said, <laughs> she said, Dave, wait a minute. What do you want to talk about? And I said, I want to talk about the steel beneath the velvet. Because we call, we, we call Mo the velvet hammer. Yes. Right? She was loving and caring and big, you know, and, and huggy kissy and all that. But man, you ever, you ever let down on a standard and you felt the hammer. You felt the steel, right? So I said, you know, we're, we're really a double-sided coin, our culture. We have the feel-good side, the Y4C2Ts, now with the E added in, right? And on the other side, the six personal perspectives. We are a, we are a high-performance, achievement-oriented culture, right? We don't just sit around and feel good with each other. We're not a daycare center for adults. You know, we're not a country club. We, we make business happen. We make money. And so Absolutely. I think that... That No, but I mean, that's the kind of double side of where we are. One is the values-based caring about things, and the other is the hard-nosed business disciplines and systems. And I Love think that. a mega agent has to combine the two of those because they're trying to build a really high-energy team spirit on their team, but they're holding people accountable. It's a no-nonsense environment. You follow our systems. You do it our way. You talk about us in the way we've talked about, and you show up when you say you're going to show up. And I think a lot of one of that's one of the other things I would say that that uh, that mega agents struggle with is accountability. 
it's really interesting because they hold themselves amazingly accountable. Yeah. I mean, most of their, you know, they're tough on themselves, but they're so soft on their staff. It just amazes me. You know, I saw Gene Rivers. He's probably one of the, for me, one of my best models. Of he just yes. like, he's chuckly and happy and fun, but he's like, hey, if you don't do 40 transactions a year, I don't know if there's a place for you here. And there you go. Like, you do 60 or 80. And he just chuckles and laughs. Yep, this is our splits. <laughs> I, if that doesn't work for you, I'm so sorry. I love you, but you know, peace out. Bye. There you go. No. Um, there, he there really does that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's so I know, I know we're at 30 minutes and Dave, mm -hmm. your time. Um, yeah. Do you need to bounce or, or do you have a few minutes yet? Because we're oh, going to continue what, another I, half hour. Uh, I can't do I can, I could do another 10. I could do okay. another 10. Then I got to, they got to run. Yep. So what we'll do is. I'd and love by to the way, I hope everyone will come back for our session this afternoon, because even as experienced as you are and as good as you are, you're going to find some real magic in this, in this sense of why list with me. When I got goosebumps, Dave, when you were talking about, you know, we have these standards, but then beneath this is a, is a level of service and care. Yes. And that's what you're going to help us put into words, what we actually feel. And that's right. Some, no, I think that's know. right. And, and, I, and, and, the, and to understand that, that um, it's really one of those things that you may feel something, but until you can really convey it, Correct. other people don't feel it. Right. And so one of the secrets of being a great salesperson in general is conveying emotional power in a, in a very uh, um, intentional way. And that's where it's why, that's why I say the power of your words. Yeah. Excellent. So I want to open it up to, for questions. I know Matt and Tracy, you have your cameras on and I know the rest of you all, you're just drinking your coffee or, you know, just out that's of your workout. We don't <laughs> know what they're wearing. I know this. This Zoom thing, you know, that's why Gary Keller at all the regional meetings, any meeting Gary has, you must have your camera on. Really? Must, oh, yes. Oh, yeah. There's no hiding behind your uh, icon or your avatar or anything else. He, he just requires that on all his meetings. He said, because it's about focus. So if you think you're going to multitask while you're listening in on one of my meetings, sorry. No, you don't do that. You oh. put your camera on. So that, and by the way, they'll... They will, if somebody's camera isn't on, they'll, his staff, he's got his team, they'll send a warning to that person, get your camera on. And if they don't turn it on, they're out of the meeting. Well, collective, collective. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that for this yeah. team. I'm not doing that. I'm not trying yeah. to put that standard here in place, but I'm just telling you, that's what Gary does, which is interesting because I know it's, it's another interesting thing for me. So I've told you I've done 90 some Zoominars across, sure. across the whole system and I'm doing one for you this afternoon. And what's interesting to me is I can tell if this office is really well led by the number of people who are live on the, on the screen, right? I'll see, I'll, I'll, go into, I'll go into like Gene Roll's office down in Atlanta. The screen is full of people live, right? I'll do another office that I thought was a, a good office, productive, but there will be like a whole bunch of the, the icons, right? Or the avatars. And, and I can tell by the response I get afterwards that, because I ask, I ask them if they want some things to, uh, to send me an email, I can tell that that, that one office has massively better uh, energy than, than the other one. So yeah, it shows up. I love that. I love that. So uh, who has a question for Dave or a comment and aha? I love to see the um, mic anybody turn black. I'll I'll speak on the aha. Hi, Dave. Good morning. I'm Latoya. Hi, Latoya. I'd love to see your beautiful face, but oh, uh, uh, I'm gonna get there. Give me five minutes. <laughs> no, um, I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, my aha was when you talked about personalities and accountability, and yes. of course, my team, not by choice, is just filled with women. There's no men at this point, and of course, you're gonna have a lot of personalities, and I have found myself over time having to address some things and some things that I didn't agree with that I feel like are a part of my business model as a team member. Yes. So it was good to hear that you pointed that out. I appreciated that. And it reminded me to touch on some things for this Saturday's meeting. I think that's good, Latoya. And by the way, uh, my, uh, my wife would honor your idea of a totally woman's team. She believed that women are more disciplined, women are more caring, women are more learning based. You know, women actually clean up after themselves, right? I mean, they, they, they actually follow systems. And so 
she would she would agree with you in that. Now all then you, all you have to overcome is the drama. Very much so. Very much. <laughs> you know, because every we all have our story. But I will yeah. tell you, one of the things as a leader you do is you set the tone. Um, one of the things, uh, for example, when I was the leader of um, uh, of a, a division of Century Twenty One, a seven state division of Century Twenty One, before I joined Keller Williams. I was I was divisional president out of out of Dallas, and we had team and we had seventy staff members, and all of a sudden there got to be these issues, and we came up with a set of of mottos for the team, and one was no victim behavior, no and NVB right NVB no victim behavior, and so if anyone would start to complain about things, or or you know, say, oh, we, we could do this if something, somebody else was doing their job. The minute we went there, people would go, they put up a V sign. That was no victim behavior. And really, it's amazing how that shaped up the team. So whatever your, the self statements you want your team to address, I agree with you. Come up with those and that becomes, that becomes a statement of your culture. Julie Hess, you raise your hand. I did raise my hand and I'm still in my running clothes. I apologize. Um, well, good for you. No, you're showing off. She's out there worried. She's already had her five mile run. So good for you. <laughs> Mine was just the aha. When you made the statement of, let me say, I wrote it down, how to do things. We get the thought, but it's the how to do things. And I call it the roadmap. Yes. And a lot of times that's where I have struggled when I go to like family reunion or I go to mega camps and I go to the breakouts and I hear all these awesome, wonderful things that, you know, agents are doing, but I'm a step one, step two, step three, step four person. I'm a very, just show me how to do it on paper and I'll go out and do it. So Jenny Wallach was kind enough to share her um, bold reverse 100. And so my team just did one two weeks ago and I thought it was highly successful only because we had step one is this, step two is this, step you. three. So when you made that comment, I jumped off my seat. I wasn't on the screen because of being <laughs> running close going, yes, yes. Yes. We, we all have the thoughts, but it's the roadmap or the how. Well, it's also why as a leader and your business leader, Julie, that you put in place systems, mm -hmm. right? Uh, page 222 in, in shift, we talk about, or in uh, MRA, we talk about building an, uh, an ops manual. And I think mm -hmm. one of the first things you do with your, your early admin uh, is you build, you begin to build the operations manual for the way your team does things. Here are the steps we follow. Here's what a listing appointment goes like. Here's, once we take a listing here, here's the checklist of all the things that happen. Here's the checklist on the way to closing. Here's, the, here, here's how our files, now I know we don't have physical files so much anymore, but that's, that's one of the brilliant things Linda McKissick had. She had a standard way that a file was kept. It was a three divider thing and every different, you know, she knew right where it was. She said, we could have a problem with a consumer and I could hop in and I could look at our file and in five minutes, I knew that transaction, right? Inside and out because it was organized. So I think one of the challenges you have, Julie, when you build a team of multiple people is to get everyone working on that same roadmap you're talking about. Yep. And here again, that ops manual, we can collaborate as a market center because we do business very similarly. And we can share those ops manual, but there's something about having to do your own. <laughs> well, it's important, a muscle. it's important to do your own because it's then you know what's there and you know why you believe in it, right? Yep. So it's one thing to try and create this sort of one thing that serves everybody. And we have, you can go on to uh, Keller Williams University and you can get a model ops manual. So that has all the different pieces and all of that. You can get that and download it. And then you can tailor it to you. That's one of the things that, uh, you know, I think that Keller Williams has tried to do. We've tried to create the models that then you can, mo that you can shape and, uh, and put your touch to it. Yeah. And, and I'm kind of hearing today that your touch is your heart. And every heart well, is different. I think it's your heart and your wisdom. See, there, there's an yep. interesting way you articulate. There's a reason you're a great producer. People love working with you. There's a set of ways you work with people that give you a reputation, right? We always say the reputation isn't your personality. It's, it's your standards. It's the way you do business. You, you're, you get a great reputation for what you get done and the way you do it. 
right? There's all different kinds of personalities that can work. Obviously, you want to be a nice person that listens well to people. But I think underneath it all, like you said, it has, you want it to have, I tell you what, you, won't, you probably won't grow it the way you want if it doesn't have your own personality in it. Needs yeah. to have that. Yep. Excellent. Well, we're at the 10 minute mark, Dave. All right. So thank you oh, so much. Oh, good to be here. And by the way, if you, you know, if you want, because be, because I have a full Zoom and R on building an MREA business, so we can even do that sometime down the, down the road. Okay. But I want to encourage everyone, Mega Camp, and then this afternoon, be here for our for our hour thirty this afternoon. This that that will be powerful. Now, Dave, are you expecting that to be sixty minutes, ninety minutes? Is there any? Well, it's um, sixty. Then it's, it's a little over sixty. And then open for questions. And depending okay. on how many questions there are, then you know we can go ninety. I can't go over ninety. My uh, I got to join my my wife at a doctor's appointment. But uh, but we'll, we'll we can go the ninety for sure. Dave, thank you so much. I look forward right. to this afternoon, and we're going to continue a mastermind here. So at your leisure. All right. Thanks, everybody. Your day. Yeah. Thanks, Dave. Take care. Bye bye. Thanks. All right, isn't that amazing? So I, Matt, you're sitting there grinning, Matt Madden. What, what, what are you hearing this morning? I was actually trying to pull up that ops manual to put it to the link in the, uh, <laughs> in the chat box here. Um, no, I, I, I think it's, it, it's just always refreshing to hear the, the fundamentals conversation. I, I also think it's, I, I liked hearing the idea that the admins give the agent leverage to, to, to grow to 100 to 120 sides by themselves and not to, you know, so many agents are in, in a huge hurry to go out and, you know, they get to 40, 50 transactions and, and they, they want to hire two buyer's agents rather than hire the two admins and get to 100. Um, and the, the impact on the bottom line would be far greater by getting to a hundred with the two admins than it would be by rushing to get the buyer's agents. So that was, that was an interesting thing. I'd like to, you know, go back to, to, to look at the math around. Love that. Now we didn't, I promised that I we're going to be. That's because people want to grow their team before, before they're ready. In other words, admin requires a financial commitment and buyer's agents require no financial commitment. So people, see it as a no risk way rather than building the infrastructure of their business. But that's, yeah. Well, that's interesting, Cal. So what I'm hearing you say is, let's say I'm at 50 transactions or 30, 30, not even 50, just 30 transactions. I'm making enough money. And I'm like, I don't know if I want to spend the, you know, $3,000 a month at first. And you mentioned it could be 5,000 a month for an admin. I'll just get a, a showing agent. Like, are you saying that that's, that's the, the, the right. thing that people tend to do incorrectly? Or they're doing 20 units because 30 units by yourself, you're, you're hopping, you know, because yeah. <laughs> the model is 25 units per person. So when you're at 25 in your own mind, can you afford to pay somebody $40,000 a year to be your assistant to go to 50? And then the second, the second admin. And for me, the aha is I just don't have the systems. I don't have that ops manual even to train people. You know, and I'm realizing I don't trust people enough to say I can train someone to show houses as well as I do. I can trust someone to, there are certain things I trust people to do, but but like on the actual interaction with people, that's where my struggle has been. And, um, but just being able to hire people and pay them a salary that they can live on versus um, hiring a buyer's agent who takes, who I give 50% to, or they give me 50% and not have the infrastructure to make it a value, a value proposition to them. Julie. I know I'm dying. I'm jumping off my seat here, Cal. 
because I know Cal, I love Cal. So we hired <laughs> our first um, admin three years ago, and I get it, Cal. I, I know what you're what you're what you're saying, and um, no, I mean that was three years ago, and she's still with us. And um, we wouldn't have been able to grow the business or do what it is that you know we're able to do now. You know, we're plugging along a little slow, a little you know, and yet. Like uh, Dave said, it's given me the freedom to do what it is that I'm supposed to do, and that's to stay in my lane, to lead gen, make appointments, you know, get those contracts, negotiate, and everything else. And also the showing agent, like I understand that as well. Will they, you know, show as well as I do? Um, and yet, if you go through the interview process, like we have a great showing agent, I absolutely um, just love her, and um, I find we're. I have more difficulty as the buyer's agents. I feel like the buyer's agents actually are more costly if they don't work um, because of the time that the team puts in to someone that may not work. And so that's where I struggle more, but I would go for that admin in a heartbeat, Cal. I think it'll change, it'll change your business. It really will. So I think we all agree that the book is amazing. So I'm just curious, like who, we don't all follow the book. We just don't. So what are some of the challenges that we're having? Like this is, we have another 15 minutes here. Like who has a challenge or right in the middle of that would be vulnerable to share it. We can kind of jump in and help you solve it. Cause we love to give advice <laughs> or even a hypothetical challenge. You can ask for a friend. I hate to be the only one <laughs> participating. <laughs> I, I gotta honestly say, I sat here yesterday in front of my desk and I felt like, who am I calling? You know, we've been doing care calls and we're loving on our database. But yesterday I just, you know, we don't have our open houses right now. And I'm not sure if we're allowed to door knock yet. And I, yesterday was my first day. I just, and I had the whole day to lead Jen and I did. And I talked to 10 people and I'm sitting there thinking if Gary Keller was on my shoulder, he'd be all over that that that's 30 people, you know, so I'm struggling with a little bit of my lead gen, to be honest with you. So uh, am I hearing you say you don't have anyone to talk to or you don't know what to say? Oh, I know what to say. I just feel like because I've been doing care calls since March 16th with uh, Pivot, oh, yeah. I, yeah. I feel like, you know, it's, I'm looking for that adding to the database. I'm looking for that. And we don't buy leads. So, so I'm just, you know, I, this is the first time that I'm feeling like, man, I'm starting to feel like we're getting behind the eight ball for the first time since COVID. I'm feeling that way with the lead generation part. And I don't know anybody, I, you know, is anybody, that's just me. I feel like we're getting a little bit behind the eight ball with listings and so forth. So. So what do you guys, let's throw it out there, in your lead gen right now, what are the conversations that are getting, you know, traction or, or having people list their houses? Or even what are the fears that we're trying to overcome? And Tracy, we'll get to your question next then. I think something that's been working for me is I, I advertise every single one of my listings and I've probably added about 50 extra, you know, 50 new people to my database around every listing that, that, that gets listed. And that's 50 conversations right there. Um, and, you know, listings are gold right now. It's a, it's a great way to, to grow your database and meet new people. So. So Russ, you're, you're adding those uh, 50 people through uh, Facebook ads or through command Facebook ads? That is correct. Um, Facebook, you know, campaigns through, through command. Um, still working on follow-up systems after a Facebook, you know, Facebook ad, but I can, I can consistently add at least 50 people per listing. And that's for about how much money? I do about $20 per listing on, on ad spend. That's it. That's it. Oh, wow. Okay. And, and it's a coming soon ad. It's not a just listed or anything like that. It's a coming soon ad for a week. And consistently I've added on average 50 people per listing. And Russ, last week you were talking to us and, and I'll just let everyone know who wasn't on the call. So Russ uses, um, home snap 
you have the Homestat Pro account to create a coming soon listing. Is that, or no, you put it in the MLS is coming soon and then HomeSnap creates a landing page for you and you use that link to create a coming soon in command um, campaign on Facebook. That's that's the kind of quick summary of it. Yeah, yeah. HomeSnap, with a HomeSnap Pro account, you get, they create a free landing page on your coming soon, which is tough to do anywhere else because nobody pulls coming soon, so. So you put your you put your listing into the MLS as coming soon, and then just grab a link from that. And without the HomeSnap Pro account, you can't get that landing page, correct? I don't think so, but I'm I'm not sure. I have a HomeSnap Pro account, so I'm not sure. I'm not sure. So, perfect. So, um, any questions for question, us on that? Ross. Yeah, Ross, yeah. I have a question. I'm hearing you say you add these 50 leads from the Facebook campaign. Has any of that come to fruition where it actually panned out that you're keeping numbers? So for every 50 you add or every 200 you add, you're actually getting one transaction? Like, are you keeping any numbers on that? Um, I, funny that you ask. I just put one of my listings under agreement and I, I double-sided it because of uh, Facebook ad. So, um, relatively new. I just started this summer in it, but I've grown my database of probably at, at least over 200 people, um, in the last couple months. So still working on follow-up systems, but, um, I've, I have probably a dozen leads that'll probably purchase in the next year or so. From those 200 Russ. And did any, did, did any convert to a sale beyond that double siding? No, the first sale I got was selling my own listing. Actually, we, we, we signed contracts last night. So. Well, that was worth it right there. That was worth your 50 bucks. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's awesome. So uh, we have time for Tracy's question. And I love this question. It's, it's um, talking about hiring your first uh, showing agent. How do you handle clients who say that they do not want a showing agent to show them their home? They really want you. And Tracy, if you're, I don't, you said your microphone doesn't work. Okay. No microphone. So, um, what are you guys feeling out there? Like, do you think it's your own ego thing or is, are your clients, you know, actually I, complaining? I've experienced it. Um, my clients complained, even if one of the team agents show it and I don't show it, it's like, but I want you to see it. And I'm like, <laughs> I want to see what I see. And they're like, no, we still want you to see it. So technically when I went on vacation, one of my clients went under contract through the team. I still haven't seen this property. It's been two weeks and they just had inspections yesterday and I couldn't meet, uh, go because of another schedule conflict. So I have to make a chance. They just want me to be there with them just to go through the property anyway even now we're past inspections. And I think people are just stuck to the fact of like Dave said, of your personality, of your, your characteristics, because that's what they're used to. Or that's what they see on Instagram or Facebook. And it's like, I want Latoya and I can't be everywhere. So I, I don't know. Um, I was spread thin, which is why I created the team. Um, and I'm trying to get people just to respect my time. And I think things like that, but in some ways I've been and other ways I don't. Huh. Isn't that the win though? Sorry, it's Andrew. Uh, it is. Because Latoya, I mean, you went through the whole transaction essentially. Mm -hmm. And I know nothing. Um, except for what's yeah, on paper. Correct. So they did it. So people do do. I think it's mm -hmm. um, half mental. And I think people right. can respect your time. A lot of times, just like you said, you said, I'm busy. I can't make it. Do you want the house or not? Especially in this market. So. Right. They're running out to that house either way. So I think you did it and that's a win. I agree. Thank you, Andrew. Um, I probably will make time this weekend just to go through it with them. But yeah, I mean, we're almost halfway through to work closing. And I, I think it's also sentimental for them because we've been working for two years and this is the house that looks, they've been under contract four times, uh, long story short. And this is the one that seems to be going right. So I, I get it. Well, here's a question. Like, are, is an our, go ahead. What? Go ahead, Cal. Sorry. 
I think it's an opportunity to, to dig deeper and asking questions. What's, mm -hmm. what's causing them to uh, resist? I mean, what's tying them to you? And to discover what, what their objections are to using someone else. Converse side of it is, have we trained our showing assistants in our, in our systems in such a way that they end up actually becoming better showing people than we are? Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's where I've fallen down on the job. Do they, the infrastructure of the house and the knowledge you show when you show people that is, is priceless. And, um, and I just haven't trained my people to understand and know that inherently when they walk into a, a house. So that's, that's what falls on me. So I think it's kind of a two-sided thing. Can I add to that? No, no, Julie, you cannot. Okay. So I think it goes all the way back to your interview. When you interview, when you meet your, your new buyers or your new sellers, and you know, I always tell agents, please, I don't care how long that interview is, take your time, lead by questioning, and then you introduce them to your team. And may I explain why I build a team? And then you explain, and then you break it down and you introduce, like we have, you know, everybody's photos there and this person does this. And then you explain the doctor situation and the beauty of working with a team and a showing agent is well, if I'm gone or I'm showing somebody else, we're going to make sure that you're not going to miss out on the home that you absolutely love. So I introduced Lisa and she's great and she's awesome. And honestly, I'll get phone calls. Like I'll chat with one of my clients like a couple of weeks ago. And she said, um, oh yeah, yeah, Lisa's daughter. I'm like, how do you know about, oh, well, she took us out for ice cream afterwards. I'm like, dang, Lisa, I don't even do that. But <laughs> you know, I think at the very beginning of the interview, and then if they understand your systems and who's, and then you ask them, are you gonna hire us? Us, not me. Are you gonna hire our team? And if they say, yeah, we're going to hire your team, great. So they have a clear understanding from the very beginning and they have understanding what the showing agent means. So I think it goes all the way back to that very first interview. Take your time and, and make sure that it's easier to go back and say, do you remember when? Than to go back and say, oh, I forgot to tell you we have a showing agent. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. I appreciate that. I think I need to create a script, um, especially because a lot of new leads just call me sporadically. Uh, which is what I'm also trying to get away from a little bit um, and just getting into the room of this is the team. So I'm, I also did a photo shoot with the team to kind of introduce them through social media. So people are used to, this is what the new room, you know, you're not always not going to get Latoya. I'm sorry, <laughs> but I well, promise, I promise they're all like me. I promise. You. Well, and, and, and actually going back to the emergency room or surgery room, a surgeon is not going to be the anesthesiologist and you know how mind numbing it is to show 10, 15 homes, like showing agents are anesthesiologists. Like, <laughs> maybe that's, I sh you shouldn't use all that in the script. You can't tell them that showing homes <laughs> are mind numbing, but that's the idea, Julie. I, I love how you said that and your team and really Cal, my aha is what you said is that your showing agent should be actually better than yourself. Like if you get to that point, you'll never get that job back. Well, and did the anesthesiologist just show, get their license and show up one day and you turn your patient over to them? Correct. No, or is no. there a whole system in which they were trained? Yep. Yeah. Well, thank you all. I have a quick question, Paul. You sent in the link for the afternoon meeting or did you? Um, it's actually in the email and you'll get an email five minutes before the event in case you okay. forget. Um, the Harrisburg Market Center, I'll set, I sent the email to Matt Madden. So if he's going to forward that, he, he already has or he will. Um, you all are invited to the 130 event. Harrisburg, thank you for joining us. This is yeah, so much fun. Yeah, thank you all. Have a good day. I, I think the next time we're going to have a rule that unless you turn your camera on, you're going to get axed. <laughs> Actually, I don't think I'll enforce that, but I, I kind of like Gina. <laughs> So Kevin, it's um, we're right at one hour. I, I'd love to hear what, what you heard today and just, just kind of your feedback on Dave and all these questions. Well, uh, first of all, Dave is, he's very inspirational. Uh, I could listen to him just teach all day long. Um, so that's my big ahas. I, I really enjoy listening to that. Uh, my other thing was a couple with 
that you've already talked about with with uh, Cal was mentioning with uh, teams bringing on buyer agents and what David said is they bring on hoping that they will create enough income to to uh, pay for their admin and instead of bringing on the admin first and building their team. So that's my big aha over there. Yeah, and Kevin, you know how we have teams that are building now and it's fun to watch how different people build um, and are, are really dialing into actually building it with that admin first and just how well, like LaToya, you got an admin, Ross started with an admin and Neve, like you all guys are just digging into this and failing forward through it. So hats off to you for, Brene Brown calls it day two. Day one is the rah-rah. The, the day two is when reality hits and you burn the ships and you only go forward. <laughs> so uh, hats off to you all for having the courage to actually follow the model and just go for it. So it's right at nine o'clock. I'll be here for another three minutes. Any, any last words or questions as people start dropping off here? Ahas. Uh Michael, you're a new face. Good to see you at the end here. Yeah, I tried to give my warning shot in the text that I was running around chasing a five-year-old and a six-year-old getting them ready for school. So you don't really <laughs> want to see all that. Probably wouldn't be very professional to show that to Dave either. So, uh, hey, guys, good to see you. Oh, that's great. Anyone else? Thanks, Paul, and I'm really looking forward to uh, Dave's session this afternoon. Uh, great job. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, be kind, wash your hands, and go love somebody. See you at 1.30. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Peace. Paul. See, See you, everybody. Have a great day.